All right, it's time to cross the T's, dot the I's for the rest of the week's top stories. And with us now, Ben Ferguson, radio talk show host extraordinaire, Michael Reed, Dow Jones deputy managing editor, and Kimberly Gulfoyle, Fox News legal analyst. And let's start with uh, Fannie and Freddie because uh, President Obama is calling for a fundamental change at the mortgage giants who've already been bailed out. We've already given them almost $150 billion. So what should the government's role be in the future? Michael, let's start with you. There, there, it seems like the discussion that they had this past week was about how much or how little government involvement should there be any. Yeah, I mean, it's home to help Americans with home ownership is a noble virtue, and the U.S. is one of the only countries in the world which does that. The problem is that Fannie and Freddie have created all these distortions in the mortgage market, which then ripple through the entire economy. People are able to buy a house, uh, a more expensive house than they really should be able to buy. Their perception of net worth rises. They this, therefore save less. And if you look at other countries around the world, particularly in Europe, which don't have these mortgage market distortions, the savings rates are different, the consumer spending rates are different. So. It's, it's noble for politicians to want to help Americans get on the housing ladder. Yeah. The reality is it's not a free market. Yeah, it, it's all right. It does distort the market. Kimberly, I mean, this is the, one of those things where for 50 years, Fannie and Freddie did fine. They acted as a little conduit to supply mortgage money. And then they said, why don't we make some of those subprime loans? Right. I mean, they're directly responsible in large part to what happened here, the economic crisis and meltdown in this, com in this country due to the subprime mortgages, which seemed like a good idea, but not when the House of Cards collapses. Now you add the government to it, because what can they really run very well at all? You've got a big problem. And in terms of looking at the forecast for the future of our economic recovery, I mean, this doesn't bode well, because there's a lot of problems and disagreements about yeah. what role, how large should the government play a, a role with Fannie and Freddie? and it doesn't serve to stabilize the market at the present time. And, and, and Ben, I, I'm guessing that you yeah. probably don't want any government involvement in any of this, but, no, I mean, but it, here's the it, problem. It, it right now, be... they're making 98% of the mortgages. There's no investor money showing up while the government's writing the checks. Yeah, I mean, the problem is it may be noble to help somebody buy a house, but it's stupid when the government's in charge of doing it. Yeah. We've seen this with Fannie and Freddie. I mean, the fact is what, what they turned into in the, in the late 90s and, and under the Clinton administration was we want you to provide loans to people that really shouldn't have a loan and no one else would loan money to them because they know it's not going to work because we think it's some right now or an obligation for the government to make sure everybody can own a house. Not everybody needs to own a house the same way that not everybody needs to go to college. Yeah, and what we did was we said everybody should have a house now and it, it was a bad idea then, it's a bad idea now. And I think Barney Frank's smart about this. He said this week, look, not everybody needs to have a house and the government doesn't need to be doing it. And I, first time in my life, I agree with Barney Frank, amen. Buddy, amen. Gonna, we're going to circle the calendar for that one. Let's move on because we have an appellate court <laughs> ruling this week that is a, a real eye-opener. It says, uh, the court said, it's unconstitutional to prevent a member of the military or anybody from lying about whether they received a Medal of Honor. What? The court said there's no evidence that such lies harm anybody and therefore they're within their freedom of speech. You're, oh, you're a lawyer. I'm shaking I... my head. And, you know, the Ninth Circuit, this is really no surprise. You've heard these stories Oh, is this before. the Ninth? Yes, exactly. Of course. Right. Yeah. The cuckoo circuit um, out there in the West. So here's the problem. Now they're saying, go ahead, say whatever you want. Say that you've got this kind of medal, that you're a decorated veteran. Use it for whatever purpose. Misrepresent. The way they're justifying it is saying this wasn't specifically tailored to say you cannot profit from it. They didn't like the way this law was written. So... People who support this law should go back and redraft it and make it in a way that is actually going to pass appellate review yeah. and constitutional muster. But it's a disgrace, really. Hey, Ben, did I tell you I was a four-star yeah. general Yeah, exactly. Hero I knew that was coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Know, I mean, it's okay to lie now. Things. It's okay. Well, I, I look at it, you know, you can't yell fire in a theater. You can't claim you're a police officer if you're <laughs> yeah. not in public. Why do, why do we say it's okay with the crazy Ninth Circuit Court, the Liberal Court of Appeals, for them to say, oh, no, 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 you can go out there and say that you fought in a war or multiple wars and you have all these badges and Medal of Honor? I mean, the men and women that serve this country, and many of them are, are good friends of mine, and I have a good friend in Iraq and Afghanistan right now, that's when it makes me angry, when you see people that are willing to put their lives in the line, that are willing to die for 
for us, willing to die for these nut jobs that, that, that claim that somehow they're the same noble person as these people over there that yeah. never did it. It should be against the law That's because and, and, otherwise, what's the point of being in the military? I mean, there's something about military men and women who serve this country, and they it's a respect issue, and if you tarnish that, What's the point of them coming home and us being proud of them if these guys can fake it and never have to serve? It, d it does tarnish the metal. And, yeah. and Michael, I mean, one of the things about this, the court says, okay, so it doesn't hurt anybody. How about the people who did yeah. receive the Medal of Honor? Yeah, Amen. I, listen, I, I actually disagree on this. I, I, it's <gasps> nice that the, it's r the, right, the right to be a schmuck is enshrined in law. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the difference with a police officer is if you're misrepresenting yourself as a police officer, that somebody may come to you you know, wanting some help. If you represent yourself as a military officer, again, I, that, that, the, clearly that's a problem. But to simply say I had a medal, it's, it's schmuck, he's a schmuck, but he's offensive. Medal but how many, how many, hold on, but at the end of the day, how many military men, something. How many if we don't have a right to lie back. about what we've done, then, then, no, 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 frankly, how many military then goes men to the seat of the resume hold on, hold on. across how your many, desk. I mean, this is how many military <laughs> men and women, how many military men and women come back to this country I don't and have that on it's the resume to go into law enforcement, to go into to protecting and serving Americans? Many military men come back and women right. and serve yeah. in the community. It's so you're saying it's okay for someone to lie right on the resume the to say but they're in the military? The First Amendment pre pre uh, protects fakers and big liars. Well, that's the thing. I just don't understand where they're getting this from. is now bigger than the founding fathers. To, ever to outlaw on this one. the right. By the way, Tom, all right, right. We'll, we'll agree to disagree I'm, on I'm that a, one. A big win this Tom, week. Tom, I've just declared myself oh my a senator. <laughs> we've got, I'm a senator now. We've got a big win a this week, and um, <laughs> we got Blago on the list. Hold on here, because we've got the Illinois governor, of course, Rod Blagojevich. Jury found him guilty on one count of lying to the FBI, deadlocked on the other 23. And uh, Ben, <laughs> Ben's I mean, the one thing they got him on was the Can fact that he was a politician Senator? that was lying. I mean, they should round up the whole crowd. <laughs> yeah, sh shocker. You know, I tell you what, Blago ought to be going out to a big old steak dinner for the fact that he only got busted for one out of all of these 24 counts. And, I, you know, I, it shows that you can pick a jury and you can always find at least one dumb person to get on there that can't figure out how to add <laughs> one plus one equals two and and not 11. So, well, you know, Blago ought to be thrilled right. about I'm, this. Now, I may disagree with you on this one. Mike, we'll come back to you because, because uh, it goes back to the fact that, okay, you can be a, a jerk and you can be crazy, but is that illegal? No, but I mean, this again is the jury system, and as Kimberly knows, it only takes one to hang a jury, and you can spend 20 days or whatever trying to convince that person, but if they've decided, they've decided. The question is now, here's the, the wider issue for um, Fitzgerald and other prosecutors. When it comes to white collar crime, when it comes to fraud, um, you know, corruption, the complex technicalities of much of it is often just too much for the jury. Yeah. And that sounds like what happened. We've seen this time and again with the SEC and various investment banks. It's just, it's so difficult. Yeah, how, do you get, how do you get a limit? And, and that, as a former prosecutor, yes. Kimberly, I mean, that's got to be you one of the things. You've got, those you got tw I, I, 24 <laughs> counts. Oh, I know. Why I didn't mean, they make like one or two and just say, here's what the guy did? Well, here, here's the deal. There's a lot of criticism of the prosecution that they didn't put on enough evidence, sufficient evidence. They had about 500 different conversations, 5,000 hours of tape. They didn't use all of that, of course. Now, going back, they're going to have to put on extra to make sure they can even get to that one rogue juror. And how about doing a better job in jury selection? Because clearly she had some like kind of yeah. teen beat crush on Blago with his name and hearts or something like that. Because she was like this, I'm not budging. They got one well, out of her and, and I, that was it. Yeah, Ben. I think the other I think the other issue here is that the government has to be a little bit smarter about how many charges they bring up. I mean, when you go, you're overwhelmed with information with 24. Pick eight of them. Pick ten yeah. of them, and, and and prosecute those very, 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 very well. <laughs> this is the problem: is there's way too many charges under same categories. I mean, there was you know five obstruction of justice charges. You know, I, well, just pick a couple and, yeah. and, and go ahead and, but, and, and nail the guy on it he instead of diluting the whole of entire honor, day. And he would be he not guilty. Yeah. He, yeah. he wouldn't even be able to charge him. <laughs> Why did you do that? Is that? One court said lines okay, yeah. and another one says you're guilty. Oh no! Right. Exactly. It was a strange week in jurisprudence. <laughs> really, it was. <laughs> really was. Yeah. All right. <laughs> ben Ferguson, thank you very much. Kimberly Guilfoyle and uh, Michael Reed, thank you for coming.